Well, Mr. Steve. Good evening. Good evening, Mr. Steve. Well, our pastor is still away, um, so he's asked me to, actually it was kind of a, a roundabout thing, he asked Rich, and then Rich asked me if I would stand in for Rich, so I guess you've got, what is it, second string tonight? <laughs> but I've, I've put together, yeah, third string, there you go, but I've put together a little something I think that will be uh, good for us to review, and uh, but before we get to that, <clears throat> let's go ahead and uh, start off the evening in prayer, and then Johnny will lead us in a few more songs, and we'll get started after that. Heavenly Father, um, Lord, I just ask your blessing on this evening. Um, I ask your blessing on the food. I bless your blessing on the fellowship. We pray, we pray tonight for uh, Pastor and Brenda as they're away. We pray for <clears throat> safe return to... St. Louis, and we also pray, Lord, um, for uh, Brenda specifically tonight. Um, we ask that uh, you would be with her and Pastor John and give them a sense of peace and encouragement. And most importantly, Lord, we ask that um, you be with the church and let us know, Lord, how we can uh, best minister and, and be of use, Lord, as um, she works her way through uh, through these uncharted waters. and. Um, we ask your blessing on uh, Joan Box. Uh, we ask your blessing on Barbara Mays and <clears throat> uh, the others on the prayer list tonight. And uh, Lord, we'll uh, we'll give you thanks and praise as we see evidence of answered prayer. And we just ask all these things in Jesus' name and for His sake. Amen. Steve, I don't think of you as third string at all. <laughs> I think you're a hot prospect being promoted up from AAA. There you go. There you go. I'm in, I'm, I'm in the minors working on the majors. Yeah. <laughs> all righty. If you would, grab your hymnals and turn to 304. Join as we sing, Send the Light. There's a call comes running o'er the restless waves. Send the light, send the light, send the light, send the light. There are souls to rescue, there are souls to save. Send the light, send the light, send the light. Send the, light. the blessed gospel light, let it shine from shore to shore. Send the light, the blessed gospel light, let it shine forevermore. We've a horse adorned, you're going to call today. Send the light, send the light. And a golden offering at the cross we lay. Send the light, send the light. Send the light, the blessed gospel, I let it shine from shore to shore. Send the light, the blessed gospel, I let it shine forevermore. We must pray that grace be everywhere about the lights and the lights and the lights and, and a Christ-like spirit everywhere be found. Send the light, send the light, send the light. The blessed gospel light, let it shine, let it shine. Oh, send the light. Send the light, blessed gospel light, let it shine, let it shine forevermore. Let us not grow weary in the work of love. Send the light, send the light, let us gather jewels for a crown above. Send the light, 
Send the light. Send the light. The, the blessed gospel light. Let it shine then from shore to shore. Send the light. The blessed gospel light. Let it shine forevermore. Now, if you turn to 417. <laughs> 417. Join as I sing, I gave my life for thee. I gave my life for thee, my precious blood I shed, that thou might ransom me. Quicken from the dead. I gave, I gave my life for thee. What hast thou given for me? I gave, I gave my life for thee. What hast thou given for me? My father's house of light, my glory circled throne I left for earthly night our wandering sad alone I left I left it all for thee hast thou left aught for me I left I left it all for thee hast thou left aught for me suffered much for thee more than thy tongue can tell of bitterest agony to rescue thee from hell I've borne I've borne it all for thee what hast thou borne for me I've borne I've borne it all thou born for me and I have brought to thee down to down from home above salvation full and free my pardon and my love I bring I bring it all to thee what hast thou brought to me gifts to thee what hast thou brought and our last song if you turn to 375 <coughs> 375 tis so sweet to trust in Jesus tis so sweet to trust in Jesus just to take him at his word just to rest upon his Jesus, Jesus how I've proved him more and more Jesus Trust in Jesus, just to trust his cleansing blood, just to insert. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust him, how I've proved him more and more. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust him more. Yes, tis sweet to trust in Jesus, just to say and tough to cease, just from Jesus simply taking life and rest and joy and peace. 
Jesus, Jesus, how I trust him, how I proved him more and more. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, hope for grace to trust him more. I'm so glad I learned to trust him, precious Jesus, save your friend, and I know that he with me, will be with me to the end. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust him, how I proved him more and more. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust him. Dr. Brown? Well, before I get too deep into it, I'm going to grab a Bible tonight. We had been up here earlier, and Rhonda had hers with her, but I don't think you've got it up here right now, do you? Your Bible? Okay, great. I'll take that. Um, so, <clears throat> here lately, we've been... Uh, teaching the youth group um, more of the basics of the faith. We've got a, a group of relatively young believers. When we first started, we had um, kids. It was, it was kind of an amazing experience. We had kids who were really, really um, interested in, in learning about the Christian faith. And um, over the years, you know, that group graduated and eventually moved on, and we've got new kids coming in. And uh, this new group of kids... Um, isn't quite as um, maybe energetic <clears throat> uh, as the initial group was. And so I think that the Lord sent us an initial batch of kids that was kind of a maybe a, an easy pitch, right? <clears throat> a slow pitch, easy to hit. And anyway, we just really clicked. But we, we've gone back to the basics with this current group of kids, and we're talking about things like um, you know, what are the two main divisions of the Bible? Uh, you know, the Old Testament and the New Testament. We're, taught, we're teaching them things about <clears throat> the gospel. Uh, how many of you guys know Connor? Uh, okay. Well, if you've seen Connor, um, do this for me. I want you to ask him, because this, this is the standard question he gets at the beginning of every youth group. I want you to ask him what the gospel means, okay? And he should be able to tell you that the gospel means good news. And then if you really want to get to him, ask him what the good news is, all right? <clears throat> and that's pretty basic for those of us in here tonight. But we ask him that every single youth group session because they are so young in the faith, and I want to make sure that they get the basics down because it does no good to sit and prepare a really deep lesson if they're still feeding on spiritual milk. And that's just fine uh, for Rhonda and I too, okay? <clears throat> because we know what we've covered with these kids, and as we continue to have them over the years, we can kind of gauge their level of growth since we're starting from the beginning. And as we get into deeper material, we can ask them questions, and we can see where they're at. One of the, one of the things we've gotten into uh, with them recently, I think it, was, it wasn't last week, but the week before, was the offices of the Holy Spirit. And one of those offices of the Holy Spirit is to, um, is to teach us things, right? The Holy Spirit is a teacher. When we receive Christ, at that moment we receive the Holy Spirit. And as we go into our own personal Bible studies, the Holy Spirit will point things out to us, right? <clears throat> um, as we get into our own prayer, uh, as we go throughout daily life, as we take time to reflect on God's Word, and as we take time to reflect on our own life circumstances over the last month, two months, three months, last year, last week, <clears throat> we begin to see things, take, we begin to see circumstances in our life and sequences of events, and we listen for the Holy Spirit's influence. We ask ourselves questions like, did I do, a, did I do correct in this situation? I, you compare your actions to what Scripture teaches us we should do in certain situations. And we begin to listen for the influence of the Holy Spirit, and we begin to discover 
things like, yes, my actions lined up with, uh, with the teachings of Christ, or no, they didn't, or maybe no, I need to do a little bit better in this particular area of my life. <coughs> so tonight, I want to cover with you, I think, a little bit of what the Holy Spirit's been teaching me over the last, um, it's been a while, probably over the last year, and uh, as Rhonda will tell you, sometimes I'm a little thick-headed, and so sometimes I think that uh, God has to stick with me for a long time, right, before I start to really put two and two together. But um, we're going to cover um, something tonight that I think that um, the Lord is trying to teach me, and and maybe if he's trying to teach me some of these things, maybe he's trying to teach you too. So um, having said that, uh, earlier this year I, I gave a sermon on the importance of of Christ's humanity and our relationship with him, okay? Now, I don't know about you, but sometimes when I've been involved in an in-depth Bible study, <clears throat> um, I can feel really close to God, and it's wonderful. Um, you know, there, there have been times in the past, not so much in the last three, four years, but there have been times in the past where I'll go into the office and I'll have, you know, maybe a two, three-hour Bible study session. And I, and I love that time when I really feel connected to God because I can feel his presence. I can feel spiritual growth. <clears throat> I can see areas of my faith uh, quite clearly that I need to work on. And uh, I, I get the opportunity to pray for people. I get the opportunity to pray for kids in the youth group, members of the church, members of my family, friends, coworkers, you name it. Um, and when I enter those really intense times of personal Bible study and prayer, <clears throat> I enjoy them so much, I kind of don't like it when it's over. And, and the longer I go without those intense periods of, of uh, communion with the Lord and, and uh, you know, study of his word, the more detached I begin to feel from God, the more I begin to long and, and, and yearn um, for uh, the, the Holy Spirit's influence in my life. And sometimes if I go long enough, God almost seems to become like this abstract ideal. Have you, ever, have you ever noticed that? Maybe sometimes you'll be talking to, for me, for example, somebody at work will mention, hey, <clears throat> my mom's going through a really difficult time right now. We had to send her into rehab, and, um, you know, they're really just down right now. And if I say, well, you know, God will take care of them. Sometimes if I've been apart from my studies for too long, when I say the word God, it just kind of has this weird resonation with me. It, it, it's almost as if God has become sort of this abstract idea rather than uh, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, the Holy Trinity. And I think that's probably true and common for most people, right? The, the, longer, we, the longer we go without an in-depth Bible study, the longer we go without prayer, the more, the more distant we feel from God. <clears throat> but <laughs> one of the things I think that we can use uh, one of the ideas, one of the, uh, the, the founding truths of Christianity that we can realize, and this is what I preached on earlier this summer. Uh, it may have actually been spring. I can't remember now. I'm pretty sure it was this year, though. But one of the things that we can do to remind ourselves that God is not some abstract concept is to, is to remind ourselves, and this is something else we've taught the kids here recently, that God isn't just God, this vague abstract concept. He is God the Father. He is God the Son. And he is God the Holy Spirit. And then we can take that further and we can say, in God the Son, we have a very special God. Okay? We have a God who was fully human, <clears throat> who came down, who left the heavenly realms, came down and inhabited flesh like we inhabit. But at the same time, even though he was man, he was also fully God. And this, this, this idea, this notion, this tenet of the Christian faith, is important for us because when we really think on the fact that we had God in the flesh and that he was human, we begin to realize that we have a God that can identify with us in several ways because of the humanity that he experienced when he was here on earth, right? Um, for example, um, when Christ was here on earth, <clears throat> he suffered. Um, and he was known as one of the... One of the uh, the, the names I'm sure you've heard, if you've been here at least at this church very long, is you've heard of God the Son referred to as the Man of Sorrows. Does that sound familiar with anybody? Okay. <clears throat> and because he's the Man of Sorrows, that's one of the names that he's known by, we know that he suffered. 
when he was here on earth. And we know that he suffered when he was here on earth because he was in human form, but also because scriptures tell us that he suffered while he was here with us. In particular, there are two different angles that I want us to think about uh, to view his suffering from. Uh, There's two sides to this coin. There was the involuntary suffering, okay? And there was also voluntary suffering. And I want to cover each of those here in the the next few minutes, but we're going to focus mostly tonight on the voluntary suffering. But when we consider his involuntary suffering that comes from or with the human condition, this means that Jesus experienced hunger. He experienced thirst. He experienced exhaustion. He experienced sickness. He experienced pain. And he experienced emotional distress at the darkness of this world. In Matthew 23, 37, um, we find Jesus kind of looking over the city of Jerusalem. And it's recorded in scripture in that Matthew uh, chapter 23, verse 37. He says, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you know, the city that has killed the prophets. He said, how many times have I just longed (coughs) to gather you under my wings as a chick would gather Uh, as a hen would gather her chicks, right? But you were unwilling. So we find that the Lord um, had emotional distress at the darkness in this world. And then we can't forget either the the scene in John chapter 11, 35, when uh, Jesus arrives on the scene after Lazarus has died. And he sees the people wailing and uh, in emotional pain at the passing of Lazarus. And it says that in the Gospel of John, it says that Jesus was overcome uh, with emotion at their sorrow. And we have the shortest sentence in the whole Bible, okay? And that is Jesus wept. So we know that Jesus suffered all of these things uh, involuntarily just as a nature of this human condition, okay, that he shares with us. And so when we go through our own suffering here on earth, we know that he knows what we're going through. Not only is it because Jesus is God, right? We, we know that. And, and, and we know that he knows our suffering because of his divinity. But we also know that he, he identifies with our suffering because he's felt the same things when he was here on earth that we felt. And if we think about that, to me, that's a tremendous comfort. We can take tremendous comfort from that because even if, even if our fellow man forsakes us, even if our fellow man doesn't understand the depth of our suffering as we're going through it, we are assured in the God that we have in Christ Jesus that he does understand because he was human and he has lived through it, both uh, as a result of, of his human condition and, and the darkness of this world. But there's, a, there's of course, the other side uh, to his suffering as well, and that's what I refer to as um, sort of the voluntary side of, the, of his suffering. Um, So, for example, his death on the cross comes to mind. That was something that was God's will for him, and he freely chose to obey um, God's will and endure that suffering on the cross for our behalf. That was a a voluntary choice that uh, that he made. We also know that um, he suffered during his care for sinners. How many times throughout the New Testament do we read about the, the scribes, the, the Pharisees, and the Sadducees criticizing Jesus because of the company he kept? Uh, time and again, um, you know, the, the, the Pharisees and the, and the Sadducees would say, you know, this man, uh, this man associates with sinners. And you can almost kind of see the, dis- you can almost imagine the disdain in their faces as they call the, the group of people that he's uh, consorting with, you know, sinners the type of people that the Pharisees and the Sadducees would have nothing to do with. And so Jesus suffered scorn because of the people that he chose to associate himself with during his ministry. We know that Jesus also suffered voluntarily because of his stance on moral issues that that caused the world to hate him. And that's something that I think that a lot of us want to distance ourselves from these days, at least... I can tell you that I certainly uh, choose to distance myself from that. Um, In fact, there there are people at work who who I I know are engaged in lifestyles that are contrary to Scripture. But in the interest of, of, quote, getting along, right, in the interest of of keeping 
uh, my religion to myself at work and letting them do their thing and letting me do my thing, I, I don't speak up in, in, those certain, in, those, in those situations. But Jesus wasn't that way. When Jesus encountered sin, although he did associate with sinners, Jesus made sure to call out the behavior and label that behavior for what it was, for sin. And, in fact, Jesus encourages us when we stay the course and when we are obedient to him on earth. In, in the book of John, you'll remember that he tells us, if the world hates you because of me, remember that it hated me first. So Jesus experienced suffering because of voluntary suffering, because of the, of the moral stance that he chose to take um, on the events that were taking place around him in his, in his day. <clears throat> So when we truly understand Christ's suffering from both of these angles, it enables us to take great comfort, as I said earlier, when we undergo our own suffering. It brings us into a closer relationship with him as we acknowledge this fact while we lean on him in our times of discomfort. Um, I, I work for, I about said I work for AT&T. That's no longer true. Uh, AT&T saw fit earlier this year to take the job that I was in along with the jobs of my direct reports. And there was about over a 1,000 of us that were impacted by this, and they, they did a, what they called a lift and shift. They took us from AT&T, and they sent us to IBM. So uh, you'll, you'll forgive me if sometimes I say I work for AT&T. I'm still getting used to the fact. It's really IBM now. But um, when I moved from AT&T to IBM, I took my direct reports with me. And uh, <clears throat> there's, a, there's one gentleman who, uh, who works out of New Jersey, and uh, he's been having a really tough time with his mother. Um, I really admire this guy for the care and love that he gives his mother. And, and you might say, well, you know, why would that surprise you? It, it's his mom. But if you knew this guy, okay, and, and the depths that he went to, to he, that he goes to to make sure that his mom has what she needs, that she's cared for medically, that, um, you know, that uh, <clears throat> she has somebody to talk to. And it's not just him, it's his sister, too. But you'd be surprised. And, and two, even if he didn't go to that depth today, there's a lot of people these days who don't take care of their parents like that. But um, I'm particularly impressed with, with him and the way that he's given care to his mom. And he told me recently, he said, look, my mom has uh, fallen again, and she's back in the hospital. Will you pray for her? Because he, he knows that I, I do believe in prayer. Uh, he knows that I am a Christian. Um, I have to be kind of careful with that, especially with direct reports in this day and age. But... I told him, absolutely, I'll pray. And, you know, one of the things he keeps telling me from time to time is my mom will just get so upset and mad at God at the suffering that she's going through. She doesn't understand why this is happening to her. And we've all been there, I think, right? Um, given the right amount of suffering, I, I think I have the potential to be there again, right? But <clears throat> what, I, what I keep telling him, what I keep reminding him, is the fact that God loves her more than she'll ever know this side of heaven. And I, and I want to, I want him, I've encouraged him to tell her that because I want her to understand that God does love her. And I haven't gotten the chance to get this in, in depth with him yet, but one of the things that I'm going to remind him is that God understands the, the pain, the physical pain that she's going through. God understands the heartache that she's going through because he's lived it. And so when we're able to communicate that to fellow believers in Christ and they truly think about that, if they, if they can, and this is hard sometimes, it's hard to set aside your own problems, right? And really focus on the true character and the nature of God. But if we're able to do that, then we can take great comfort from the fact that we know, we know that God understands the suffering that we're going through. I also think of that verse in the Old Testament um, that uh, um, I think it was... Uh, Gideon, perhaps, who said, you know, thou God seest me. I was, I was driving from uh, St. Louis. I think we were going to see uh, Mindy and Kyle, some of our college friends, and there off to the side of the road was a sign in a field that had that very verse. It said, thou God seest me. And sometimes I think we take that for granted. We, we, we approach God as this kind of ambiguous, benevolent, fatherly figure that, that we feel is so distant from us that we, we can't possibly take comfort in him. And that's far from the fact. When we truly realize that he understands us because he created us, he understands us because he's God, but most importantly, he understands our circumstances because he's lived them, 
then that helps us identify. It brings us closer with him. So um, when we truly understand Christ's suffering from these angles, it does bring us into a closer relationship uh, with him as we acknowledge this fact while we lean on him in our times of discomfort. And it enables us to provide relief to others. Uh, in addition to this uh, guy that's on my team at work, uh, there was a young lady who was in our youth group. Um, she's not a regular member. She comes, I don't know, maybe once every four months or so. Um, but she was describing these, this Alzheimer's disease and the progression, the toll it was taking on her grandmother. And um, I, this is an opportunity that I did have to explain to her that um, God is in, uh, intimately acquainted with the suffering um, that we experience here on earth. And so she was able to take some comfort from that. But I've been wondering lately um, about the voluntary suffering um, that Jesus went through. You know, and, and as I said earlier and at the start, <clears throat> I wonder about it because as I listen for God's voice throughout the day, and, and there are time periods where I'm much better at this than others, um, and here lately I feel like I'm kind of I'm rebuilding my relationship with God as a result of, as a result of the turmoil at work as a result of, uh, you know, personal circumstances. But as I listened to, to God here recently, I have to ask myself, um, how much suffering do I voluntarily enter into on the behalf of others? Okay? And, and I, don't know, I don't know if you've ever asked yourself that question, but I can tell you one of the things that kind of prompted me down this road, this line of personal inquiry, was uh, the fact that... Um, and I, I don't want to embarrass her, but my wife is, is real good at this, okay? She's real good at setting aside her own cares and concerns for the benefits of others. And there's times that she fails there too, you know? But, um, but we can learn from each other, can't we, right? And so <clears throat> um, in addition to observing the circumstances around me and listening to God's voice, her example is, is kind of a further source of input for this, this thought, this notion of how much, how much suffering am I willing to enter into on behalf of others willingly, okay? My dad was a, a, a firm believer uh, in an acronym called M-Y-O-B, mind your own business, right, okay? And, and honestly, truthfully, I think we can all kind of see the wisdom in that, right? I mean, if we all kind of keep to ourselves and we let Larry do Larry's thing, and we let uh, George do George's thing, and we let Gene do Gene's thing, right? Then life is, is easier. And, and that kind of that, that line of thought, that, that life philosophy, extends over into the realm of suffering, too. You know, how willing are we to intervene in another, circum, in another individual's circumstances to provide relief from suffering, to provide. Uh, ministerial counseling, to provide resources, to provide, you name it, in the name of the Christian faith to honor the cause and glorify Jesus, right? How, how willing are we to do that? If we keep to ourselves, <clears throat> the answer is not very willing. And so I don't blame my dad for this, please understand. But from that background where you kind of keep to yourself, you mind your own business, if you make a habit of that, you've got some really tall blinders set up in front of you, Right? And, and you can get used to living that way because, quite honestly, it makes life simple. But you have to ask yourselves, I think, as, as Christians, and, and, I, and I'm asking myself this too, how far am I, not only do I do it enough, but how far am I willing to go to suffer myself on the behalf of others? And if you look at what's going on in the news today, okay, we're at a really unique time in, in our nation's history. Um, both political parly, parties are as polarized as they ever have been. If you, if you look at the right news sites, okay, there's even talk of, of civil war, which is unimaginable, even in this day and age, to me, right? It, it just is. So what's the point in bringing this up? Well, we live in a pretty good nation still, right? Things are good for us. Um, you know, California starting to see rolling blackouts, um, you know, and there's a lot of troubles on the horizon. There are, truly. And it wouldn't take much, it really wouldn't, to upset the apple cart in this nation. We rely so much on our supply chain to bring food to the grocery stores, 
to keep shelves stocked, it wouldn't take a whole lot, right, for us to see this apple cart upset. And when that happens, we're going to have a lot of suffering in this area. We're going to have a lot of suffering in the nation. We're going to have a lot of suffering in the world. Perhaps it never gets that bad. But the point is, is if you don't prepare yourself now to, to think about these, these more difficult aspects of the Christian faith, if you don't prepare yourself now to think about what you're going to do, all right, you may find yourself not conforming to the will of God in Christ Jesus in these circumstances, myself included. So I have begun to ask myself, how far am I willing to go to suffer for the cause of Christ and the benefit of other people? How far would I go? So that voluntary aspect of suffering has been on my mind um, quite a bit lately. And God has a lot to say on this topic. For example, uh, in Mark <clears throat> chapter 10, 21, uh, we have Jesus telling us to, to take up our cross daily, right? And, and, and that cross is not an instrument of, of comfort, okay? That cross is an instrument of execution. It's an instrument of death. And so as unpleasant as that sounds, if Jesus tells us to take up our own cross, to me that says quite a bit. It says that we ought to be willing to suffer for the cause of Christianity. We ought to be willing to em embrace the problems and, and not just look out after ourselves. And there's a lot that comes with that phrase, take up thy cross, but I think certainly the willingness to, to suffer uh, if we have to for the benefit and the cause of Christ needs to be, needs to be taken in, 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 into consideration under that statement, under that verse. Let's also think about uh, 2 Timothy. Uh, in 2 Timothy, Paul says <clears throat> something to the effect of, you know, if, if you suffer, if you're willing to suffer with him, then you'll be able to partake in his glory, too, at the same time. So that's another verse that, that kind of, that kind of uh, paints the picture for us. Matthew 8.20. In Matthew 8.20, um, we have this, uh, follower of Christ coming up to Jesus and saying, you know, Jesus, I'm willing to, to follow you anywhere. And Jesus kind of says, okay, well, let's put this to the test. And he asks this man, he's, where he tells the man, he says, in effect, are you sure? Because the Son of Man has, he says, birds of the air have nests, foxes have dens, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. So he kind of challenges the, the man on that, on that assumption, just the way I'm feeling challenged in this notion of suffering, voluntary suffering myself. And he asked this young man, he says, well, that's all well and good, but do you truly mean it? <clears throat> because when you follow me, I have no place to lay my head. And that, again, is another kind of indication of the, the willingness that we need to have to voluntarily suffer for the cause of the kingdom. And then finally, we can't ever forget the story of that rich man and Lazarus. Remember that? that uh, Lazarus was the poor beggar who sat outside this rich man's gate. And uh, scripture tells us that he longed to eat the crumbs that fell from the rich man's table. And even the dogs would come and lick this poor, uh, this poor beggar's sores. Remember that story? And so uh, both men die. <clears throat> We're told that uh, the rich man, uh, or sorry, Lazarus, goes to uh, Abraham's bosom. And he's an, uh, and, and, but yet the rich man is in torment. And in fact, he's able to see Lazarus being comforted. And he says, you know, he says, <clears throat> uh, Ab Father Abraham, send Lazarus over to dip his hand in water, his finger in water, and touch it to my tongue to ease my suffering. And Father Abraham's response is, is very telling here. <clears throat> he turns to the rich man and he says, Remember that in this world you had everything that you ever wanted, everything, but yet Lazarus suffered day in and day out, so I won't allow that. And furthermore, a great chasm is, separated, is separating the, the two of you, and no one can cross that. You can't go to him, and he can't come to you. So <clears throat> here again, we have this idea, the fact that this rich man was enjoying life. He had everything he ever wanted. And yet, and yet, okay, Lazarus suffered, and the rich man was unwilling to apparently ease Lazarus' suffering in this life. So that's yet another example of, of what Scripture has to say about this. But 
<clears throat> I don't want to end there. Let's take a look at, at three, I call them contemporary Christians, but um, the oldest of these goes back to uh, the 1500s, and I, I promise I'm not going to go into a, a detailed life biography on, on each of these three individuals, but I do want to touch, touch base on them real quickly. All right, David Brainerd lived from April the 20th, 1718 to October 9th, 1747, and if you do the math, that's 29 years old. How many of you guys have heard of David Brainerd before? <clears throat> okay, well, he was a missionary to Native Americans. And when he got started in his ministry, as his ministry was just starting, he came down with uh, consumption, tuberculosis. And that was a, that was a killer um, on, a, on up into the, uh, the 20th century. Um, in fact, my uncle passed away of, well, not my direct uncle, but a distant relative passed away of consumption in a sanitarium in Mount Vernon, Missouri, like in the late 30s. So it was with us up until then, and it's still here today. But David Brainerd, uh, as soon as his ministry started, came down with consumption. And yet, <clears throat> in the seven years that he had to spend ministering to those Native Americans, he never once stopped. In fact, it's, it's, it's estimated that he, that he crossed 3,000 miles on horseback, sick with tuberculosis, to make sure that the Native Americans had every opportunity, that, that he encountered, had every opportunity to come to salvation in Christ. In fact, at the end, uh, and, and kind of another twist, at the end, have you guys, have any of you heard of Jonathan Edwards? Okay, he's the one that gave that famous sermon, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. Well, he had a daughter named Jerusha, I think was her name. Um, I'll have to double check. But uh, at any rate, this daughter nursed David Brainerd at the very end of his life <clears throat> when David came to stay with her. And as a result of the care that she gave David Brainerd when he passed away, she passed away months later because of consumption as well that she most assuredly got while taking care of David Brainerd. Both of these missionaries, well, David Brainerd the missionary and Jonathan Edwards' daughter, voluntarily suffered for the cause of Christ. So that's one example. Uh, another example that I want to uh, call out tonight is David Livingstone. How many of you guys have heard of David Livingstone? Dr. Livingstone, I presume, right? Um, well, he was a, uh, <clears throat> he lived uh, March 19th, he was born 1813, passed away uh, May 1st, 1873, but he was a tireless English missionary to natives in Africa for 30 years. Uh, his wife died by a river in Africa while giving birth to their sixth child, all right? Um, you know, I, I don't know about you guys, but when I'm far away from home, the last thing I, you know, I want to do is, is pass away in a foreign country where I don't have you know, my friends and family around me, but this lady did as a wife of, of, Dave, of Dr. Livingston. And uh, <clears throat> Dr. Livingston himself became so sick that at one time he could scarcely lift a pen, all right, and put it to paper. And he literally died of malaria and dysentery and was found on his knees in prayer, okay? That's another, that's another example. In fact, the natives knew that he loved them so greatly um, that... Um, when the natives of Africa found him dead, um, they actually, and this is kind of gruesome, but they, they cut out his heart, and the, but they, they took it and they buried it under a tree in Africa. And then they took what, his remains and they transported it over to, uh, I guess what would have been the, the west coast of Africa so that they could be shipped back to his native country in England. But the natives knew that because of that man voluntarily suffered on their behalf, there was no question in their mind of the great love that man had for them because of the cause of Christ. So that's another one. And the third example that we, I want to cover tonight <clears throat> is that of Hugh Latimer. Um, anybody hear that name before? This one was kind of new to me. Actually, I'd read about him once, but long since forgot about him. Anyway, um, Hugh Latimer uh, was born 1487 and passed away October 16th, 1555. And Hugh Latimer is famous for supporting uh, the Reformation, the cause of the Reformation in England. And in fact, <clears throat> um, Hugh Latimer refused to believe in some of the central tenets of what was then uh, the Anglicanized faith and, and also uh, Catholicism by refusing to believe in the transubstantiation of the sacraments in, in Mass, which uh, is um, basically the belief that 
uh, the body and blood uh, that, the, that are the symbols that they use actually turn into the actual body and the actual blood of Christ during uh, communion. Uh, the Catholics believe that to this day, and my, mo- my mom's one that believes in it. But Hugh Latimer said that's not biblical, and he refused to believe it. He also refused to believe in the fact that simply going to Mass has an impact on the forgiveness of sins. And so Hugh Latimer said, no, that's not biblical. I, I don't support that belief. And so <clears throat> he was in prison once or twice, but ultimately Queen Mary uh, came into power. And Queen Mary was doing everything that she could to roll back the influence of the Reformation and bring Catholicism back to England and to Ireland. And so she and Hugh Latimer kind of had it out. Well, ultimately, Hugh Latimer was tried and uh, was imprisoned in the Tower of London. And he ultimately paid for his beliefs um, with his life. In fact, um, Hugh Latimer (coughs) was uh, said to have said, after the sentence had been pronounced, he said, I thank God most heartily that he hath prolonged my life to this end, that I may in this case glorify God by that kind of death. To which the prolocutor replied, if you go to heaven in this faith, then I will never come hither as I am thus persuaded. Hugh Latimer was burned at the stake along with a fellow named Nicholas Ridley. And he is quoted as having said to Ridley, play the man, Master Ridley. We shall this day light such a candle by God's grace in England, as I trust, shall never be put out. That was a man who, with his companion, Nicholas Ridley, voluntarily suffered for his beliefs. So each of, these, each of these are very powerful examples for us to consider. Each of the three individuals could have easily have elected not to suffer, but none of the three did so. This suffering didn't come as a result of just living in this broken world. As we tell the kids, this world is broken. If you take a piece of iron, you throw it out in the rain, what's going to happen to it? It rusts, right? But there's more that comes uh, with this broken world than just rust. We've got sickness. We've got abuse. We've got all the sins that beset this world because of man's fallen nature, but also because we're taught in the book of Genesis that this world, this creation, has a curse put on it, and that, and that the very creation itself is groaning and longing to be freed from this this curse <clears throat> that it's currently under. But, um, so their suffering didn't come as a result of just living in this broken world. It was voluntarily, but more importantly, it was voluntary to further the cause of Christ and his kingdom. The initial encounter of suffering brought about by voluntary action on this part didn't lead them to shy away from the cause of Christ, but it emboldened them. And it's this point that I think is definitely worth of additional thought. If it was true for us, if it was true for them, wouldn't it be true for us too? That is, if the initial bout of suffering that these, that these people that we've talked about tonight went through wasn't enough to cause them to reverse course and say, no, no more of this. I refuse to suffer any longer on Christ's behalf. If it didn't do that to them, I have to wonder whether it would do that to myself. If I open myself up to a little more discomfort for others' benefit, if I open myself up to a willingness to go without so that someone else may have, right? All these things we need to consider because it's, it's, part, of, it's, part, of, um, it's part of that gospel experience. And if, if it didn't cause them to turn about and reverse course, why would it cause us to do the same thing? So to be sure, I, I don't know that, that Jesus expects each of us to suffer in the same way that each of these three did, right? And I also don't know that any of us are up for the type of suffering that uh, other missionaries and other Christians have had, to, have had to go through in years past. But what I, want, what I wanted to do tonight by covering this material is just to get you thinking about it. And I've been thinking about it myself. If I can, take, if I can be a little more willing, all right, to put self aside, even maybe to the point of suffering a little bit, to advance the cause of the kingdom, if I can just do a little bit myself in that direction... I think that would please God based on what I know of Scripture, based on what I know of some of my Christian contemporaries, based on what I know when I really listen to the Holy Spirit try and tell me and teach me and lead me to become more Christ-like. And so I don't want us to think that we have to prepare ourselves for some sort of um, exponentially difficult period of suffering, but I want us to think about it and be willing to extend ourselves a little bit for the cause of Christ because when we do that, right, if we take that first step, 
then as we've seen, maybe we're willing to take a little a step a little, a, little for, uh, a little further, right? Maybe we're more willing to, to uh, promote the cause of the gospel and the cause of Christ in these circumstances. And so that's what I really wanted to get us thinking about tonight. Um, I read a book not too long ago, and we're going to close with this. <clears throat> but um, the book was written by a, 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 Scottish, um, a Scottish pastor. His name is Ian McLaren, and the, and the title of the book is Companions of the Sorrowful Way. All right, And let me just read what he has to say. He says, It is not by the way of learning, but by the way of suffering, that we come unto knowledge And he was right, who, when asked how he came to know so much, pointed to the crucifix. They who sail on the surface of a summer sea gain no treasures, but they who, weighed down with sorrow, fear not to sound the depths, return to the light with pearls in their hands. And I thought that that was an excellent summary, right? And we can think of that in our own circumstances and realize that it's true. I know that the times when I've grown the most spiritually are times when I have gone through suffering, and it's not fun. Um, most of the suffering that I've done in this world is involuntary as a result of circumstances I didn't ask for, as a result of difficult relationships, as a result of my own besetting sins, right? I've done very little voluntary suffering, but the involuntary suffering that I have done in this world leads me to believe that the statement that Ian McLaren had in that book is absolutely true. And again, the goal in tonight's message is just to get us to think about that, all right? Maybe if we open ourselves up just a little more to to personal voluntary suffering, maybe we can have even more of an impact for the kingdom, all right? And with that, I think we're out of time, so let's go ahead and close in prayer. Heavenly Father, um, I thank you, Lord, that you do strive with us, that you do uh, speak to us, and that you do open Scripture up. Um, that you do enable us, Lord, to to understand your nature, and by understanding your nature, um, enable ourselves to be more conformed to it, Lord, so that uh, you're glorified, so that you're pleased, uh, so that we grow, so that we feel closer to you. And I ask tonight, Lord, that uh, we just think about um, the message and maybe be a little more willing to open ourselves up to, to voluntary personal suffering for the benefit and cause of your kingdom, not just suffering for suffering's sake, but suffering when your kingdom is on the line. Um, Lord, I pray that, uh, <clears throat> again, that you'll be with Pastor John and Brenda uh, as they're traveling back. Um, there's a lot of people in our prayer list tonight, Lord, that uh, could use your healing influence in, in their lives. And uh, we pray for Barbara Mays. Um, we pray, Lord, for Leora Chapman. Uh, we pray for Uh, Joan Box, and I know there's several others, Lord, that I failed to mention. And I pray for those of us here tonight, Lord, who may have personal circumstances that uh, that we're worried about. Maybe there's something in our lives, Lord, that we're struggling with. I just pray that uh, your Holy Spirit would speak to us and enable us to take comfort in your word, enable us to take comfort in your nature, enable us to take comfort in your Son. And we ask all these things in the name of Jesus and for his sake. Amen.